On December 28, 1996, Victoria's record snowfall causes power outages and strands vehicles across the city. What's worse, even more snow is on the way. A disaster on their hands, authorities call for emergency aid from the military. We had a, a driver's course going on at Elbert Head, and it was because we needed the vehicles, because most of the vehicles were there for the driver's course. Uh, you know, we, phoned, we could phone out there and ask them to try and get the vehicles in. Unfortunately, most of the military vehicles at Albert Head are buried in snow. Even heavy-duty off-road vehicles are immobilized. These things were stuck. Couldn't move them for all the power that thing had in six-wheel drive. In low gear, wouldn't move. The wheels are just spinning. Military personnel attempt to clear the four-kilometer road from the base to the highway without the aid of appropriate shovels. It will be 12 hours before the Army can help stranded citizens caught in Victoria's worst snowstorm. December 29, 1996, dawns on the snow-stricken city. Stacy Kissa, a Doneman excavating employee, prepares his old snowmobile before leaving for work. It hadn't run for about seven years. I knew it was probably going to be okay in getting me into work. That's about all I knew. At the same moment, Marlene McClure and a few other concerned neighbors check in on Elizabeth Mackay, whose husband was admitted to hospital after a heart attack. She came to the door and of course she was very emotional and she had been talking to the nurse at the hospital. He had been explaining to her that Richard had flatlined several times but had responded, come back, and the nurse felt that he was just waiting for Elizabeth to be at his side. Marlene searches for some way to get her neighbor to the hospital, quickly losing hope. Marlene at last calls her friend Monty, a backhoe operator for Donman Excavating. I explained the whole situation to him and he just felt there was no way the backhoe could come into our neighborhood. We have a lot of hills and it would be really difficult. So uh, as we talked and I said, well, at least we've tried. I'll tell her we tried, Monty. As Monty is about to hang up, Stacy stops in to say hello to his coworker while on his way to the Doneman excavation yard. And just then he said, hold on, here's Stacy on a skidoo. And he, I guess, was able to pass the phone to Stacy. They were hoping to get a lady to the hospital. And there was some very serious concern in Marlene's voice. And I didn't know what was all happening with Mr. Mackay. I knew I was scared to commit to it because of the unreliability of the skidoo. But something inside just said, go ahead. With all emergency services cut off by the snow, CFAX, a local radio station, takes control of the situation, recruiting and coordinating listeners to help with relief efforts. Greg Moran took over control of the radio station at 2.15 in the morning, stopped all regular programming. Greg was on the air solo for about seven hours. Just, just like the old days of radio. Microphone, Greg, and the telephones, and our listeners. From delivering medication through waist-high snow to getting emergency victims to hospital by snowmobile, ordinary people take on heroic roles. Ken Ryan heads for Canadian Tire, his workplace, to investigate the alarm system that had gone off. Because no police cars could go, no ambulances, there was not a single vehicle to be found uh, moving. When you're going through snow that's up to your waist, and uh, it took me about two hours uh, to go probably two blocks. He comes across a buried truck parked in the middle of the road. You're thinking, why is this truck in the middle of 
of a street. I cleaned off a little bit of the snow on the windshield and there was a person inside there. And um, I looked and I tapped on the windows and he wasn't, he wasn't responding. And I could see his lips were um, blue. They weren't black, but they were just a little bit blue. And so then I went into the panic stage, like, you know, I need to get this guy out. So then I started taking the snow off and taking the snow off, and I finally opened up the door and uh, just trying to wake up the gentleman. And, and he was uh, in a daze, um, uh, very, very, very cold. So I was trying to talk to him, and he was just kind of mumbling words, and where am I, and who are you? Between the, um, uh, where the truck is, and the uh, store was about 200 feet, so I had to drag the two of us across this parking lot with snow up to your waist. After he's revived, the rescued man explains his situation. He was going to the store to get some, I believe it was milk and bread or eggs or something, and he got a little bit stuck and thinking, okay, the snow's gonna stop, I'll just sit here with the truck idling, and he fell asleep. Without even an exchange of names, they part ways. Meanwhile, volunteer rescue efforts continue to be coordinated over the airwaves, and the military, after digging itself out, arrives and quickly sets to work. Some of my duties included, uh, we had to help clear off the snow off roofs, because they were in danger of collapsing. Uh, we did that over next door, actually, the, the fire department. Roofs are designed to withstand 20 pounds per square foot, but snow loads easily double that weight. I've never felt a, uh, <laughs> the roof of any building sagging as I walked on it. And we all got on top and oh, like, oh my God, let's just get the snow off of here before it comes down under our feet. Though the Army makes great strides in saving many roofs from buckling, Dave Aylard's dairy farm isn't so fortunate. We just heard a big whump and turned around and, and uh, one barn was just flat, just absolutely flat. Inside the barn are 32 heifers, now trapped under the collapsed building. Dave quickly attempts to remove the debris before it's too late. You didn't want to get too close to where the animals were. You have no idea what's, what's going to be like when you know when you do finally get them out. Dave and the farmhands managed to clear off the debris of the fallen barn. Lo and behold there was some live animals in there um, and just it was a really miraculous feeling when they started walking out and they literally just started walking out. Of the 32 head of cattle miraculously only four are lost. Dave Aylard averts one disaster, but it's not long before he faces a new threat. Meanwhile, the Aylson situation goes from bad to worse. Until 1996, Victoria, British Columbia had never seen this amount of snow. Everyone tries to cope as best they can with the rare weather, but roads are impassable. Once Michael Aylson returns to his house, he and his wife prepare themselves for an at-home delivery. I skied back and I remember saying to my wife that, um, yeah, if, if we have that baby, I mean, it's, it's going to be born at home. Our doctor phoned and he said, I suppose you're going to have that baby today, aren't you? <laughs> and I wasn't sure, but... I said, yeah, I thought so. Doctors give her the number of a nurse who lives in their area, just in case. About uh, early afternoon, when I felt like I was going into labor, and I called um, the nurse, Evelyn, who lived just about five minutes away. And she said that she would come over. The normally five minute trip takes Evelyn Malcolm and her husband over one hour to complete. I stayed around for about an hour 
and she didn't kick into labor properly, so I said um, that we would go home for a while. To ensure her safety and a speedy return home, the Ailsons lend Evelyn an old pair of snowshoes. Well, we were hysterical about these snowshoes because we'd never used them before, but they were absolutely marvelous. We got home in 20 minutes. As Evelyn and her husband make their way home, Stacy Kissa arrives to take Elizabeth Mackay to the hospital. I believe they even helped put her arms around me so that she could hold on to me. When we left her house, I still was not aware what was going on. I knew I was taking her to the hospital, but that was really all that I knew. It isn't long before the pair encounters their first obstacle. We were probably not even out of sight when we took our first spill. Because the snow was so deep, the skidoo would sink, but it would sink on its side. And then I would have to get myself out, lift Mrs. Mackay up, right the skidoo, restart it, and carry on. When she got back on, and and away they went again, and, and uh, I said a little prayer because I thought, oh, I think this is going to be rough going that whole way. The snowmobile frequently stalls and sinks into the snow. To make matters worse, the only two snow plows in the city are stranded, leaving behind a steep grade in the middle of the road and making highway driving even more treacherous. We was able to get down to the highway with the skidoo and then I trekked back up the, the snow bank and we waddle down and get on the skidoo and start it again with the pull cord and make our way to the, start making our route to the hospital. Stacy Kissa and Mrs. Mackay finally arrive at the hospital after a grueling two hour trip. I dropped Mrs. Mackay off. I don't even know if she what we said to one another, but some people with the hospital staff greeted her there. They were waiting for her, and off she went. Inside the hospital, Mrs. Mackay at last reunites with her husband. When she got into the hospital, the nurses immediately took her to her husband's side and she said, Richard, you'll never guess how I got here. And so she told him her episode, and he, he opened his eyes and looked at her, and she knew he understood. And she said, I love you, and he, then he took his last breath. Miles away from the hospital, Evelyn Malcolm rejoins the Ailsons as Joy's labor suddenly switches into high gear. I guess 4, 3.30 or 4, I, I felt like I was, I was progressing in the labor fairly quickly. Her water broke and um, Megan was born at quarter to 7. That was great. Megan Ailson is born at 6.45 the evening of December 29th, 1996. To many people in Victoria, she'd be known by another name. People um, just referred to her as the blizzard baby when we were out and about. We would see people in, the, in, a, in a shop or at a restaurant and, and they would come up having recognized us, I guess, and say, oh, is that the blizzard baby? On the Aylard farm, Dave faces another impending threat. The one barn that we hadn't shoveled off um, I was having a pretty good look at because I was, I was concerned about it. And I did notice one place where there was two. So I thought we'd best do something about that. And I was just going, going to go down and measure up what I needed for a poke to put, put under these trusses. And I heard a crack. The roof truss starts to buckle under the weight of the snow threatening to bury over 150 head of cattle. One of the fellows that works for me, Don, uh, was about to leap over the fence to chase all the cows out, and I grabbed him and hauled him back because I didn't want anybody going in there. Luckily, Dave averts yet another potential disaster. 
and we sent the dog in. And she got all the cows out of the feed alley um, and pushed them up right up to the far corner of the barn where we opened up the gates and uh, persuaded them that it was a good idea to go outside into their summer paddock, <laughs> which they weren't very keen on, I can tell you, because there was a good three feet of snow out there. Um, but we managed to get them out. Moments after the last of the livestock are evacuated, the barn roof crashes to the ground. At last, the snowstorm relents, allowing the city to dig itself out from under the snow. But there is one casualty involving a Navy lieutenant found dead in his car from carbon monoxide poisoning. His exhaust pipe was blocked by snow buildup. As the normal warm temperatures return, the snow melts, causing widespread flooding. Cleanup takes weeks and insurance claims total over $120 million, the largest insurance payout in Canadian history to that time. Years later, people still remember the few moments of triumph that came out of the most severe snowstorm to ever hit Victoria. I talked to Stacy, I guess, after it was all over, and the thing that really stuck in my mind that he just persevered, you know, he he really probably should have refused my request on the phone and knew how difficult it would be, but he, he wanted to help too. And that really made me proud of him. You know, he's a good friend. Alan Perry's staff at CFAX are recognized for the crucial part they played in the city's relief effort during the storm. All the emergency agencies in Victoria got together and created a big wooden shovel with all their logos on it and the simple message that said, one team, one goal. And that was a very powerful moment for us as people said thank you. Two years after Victoria's record-breaking snowstorm, another strange weather-related event assaults British Columbia. This time, the perpetrator isn't a cold front, but a heat wave, and the most unusual weapons are released from weather's arsenal. 